Hi everyone. This is the third attempt to make this video because John and I aren't very good at audio equipment as it turns out. Anyways, I am standing in the back garden. Third time for this joke. The back garden of the illustrious, the magnificent, the beautiful Johnny Boy. Far off station you may recognize him as. Um, well, in more illustrious, more esteemed, and more degenerative circles. That joke was a lot more funny when I said it completely off the cuff. He is known to us as Halberd Man. He is known as Halberd Man because he happens to own a halberd. It's a beautiful piece of equipment used by sergeants of the 10th Regiment of Foot. Um, the 10th Foot portrays a very early war style of um, British soldier from the American War of Independence. And uh, as a sergeant, because of that, he is carrying a polearm. Now, polearms were used, a variety of different polearms, were used by uh, various armies um, throughout the 18th and early 19th centuries um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, in some wars, in some armies, some campaigns, you may see junior officers, men like uh, ensigns or lieutenants or captains carrying a polearm. Um, in other time periods, you may see NCOs, like a sergeant being the one to carry a polearm. They fell out of use in North America, at least during the American War of Independence, fairly early on. Um, but we'll talk about all that later on. They're not always the most practical things to have in the field. But for, for, for starters, I want to talk a little bit about the, um, the advantages of them, the reasons why they may have been given to armies, the potential reasons they'd be expected to have, or uh, potential uses they'd be expected to have, and, um, yeah, and just, just, just why to bother with them, why they're so much fun. I mean, God, it looks so good, doesn't it? We'll come to that later. So for starters, a polearm, whether it's a spontoon or a spontoon as it's sometimes called, whether it's a pike or whether it's a halberd, um, can, among other things, be used, for example, as crowd control. So you can imagine, I am a sergeant, I'm standing at the furthest, uh, I'm standing on the right-hand side of my line. There's a line of men, say 10, 20, 30 men across, and um, we're advancing across broken, sort of craggy terrain, rocky, whatever you want. Uh, whether we're advancing slowly in line or whether we're, you know, really dashing, running across the field, it's very possible that as we're getting fired on, as we're moving across that terrain, the line's going to be a little disrupted. It's going to break up and things will get a little chaotic. Uh, and in that sort of situation, rather than just like stretching out my arm and saying, all right, everyone, like stop right here, a really practical use for the polearm might be to stretch it across and say, all right, everyone, you know, form up here, form a line on this, you know, on this position or whatever, form front. Just shout that out and everyone will know what to do. Um, and that means that everyone is able to dress up to the same line, to the same position, so that way you're maintaining that formation even if everything is very chaotic. It's a very easy, it's a very direct way of getting that message across. Um, a lot of times in reenactment you'll see that kind of thing happening even with muskets. I mean, mus musket with bayonet fixed is a really long you know, thing that you can use to get that point across. Well, that's the point, but that's a different kind of point. Uh, you also see a lot of times in reenactment, sergeants will actually break ranks, run ahead of their men, and put it forward so, again, everyone can run up to it. Now, whether the polearm was actually used in that kind of context for that kind of reason historically, I don't know. Um, never seen any primary sources to indicate that, although there are a number, uh, written primary sources that is, uh, but there are also a number of paintings where uh, you will see, you know, sergeants or junior officers and whatnot sort of using it to line up their men. I know at least there's a couple from the Seven Years War. Um, you know, I can't really say, there's not an awful lot written about the practical use of a polearm. It's one of just a number of possibilities. Um, but it rather shirks in comparison, I think, to the main reason, which we'll come to later on. Uh, now, another reason why you might want some of your men, like again, like I said, officers or sergeants or whatnot, to carry a weapon like this is, well, for the obvious reason. If you enter into a melee engagement, it's going to give you a lot more reach than just a bayonet is going to do. I don't know if you can see the entire thing there, but it's going to give you a lot more reach. Um, as it is, actually, a musket with a bayonet is a pretty long weapon, so this is quite impressive to be able to outreach them. Um, I'm not a HEMA guy. I'm not Matt Easton. I'm, I'm not um, uh, Chataversity or, or Lendy Beige or whatever, so I can't show you how this thing would actually be used. The best I could do is like some weird, rough, uh, weeby impression, got an anime on my side, but I don't think that's going to be terribly useful for anyone. Um, gotta hate the fact that that's a clip that's out there in the world now. Anyways, it's going to give you a lot more reach in a melee, in a melee fight. So, so there's a potential use there, especially you can imagine uh, in a more Napoleonic environment where sergeants are carrying pikes, you know, you can thrust this thing out um, in, in a square and, and that's going to be, uh, it's going to be pretty convenient for you. Uh, 
But it's also worth mentioning that a lot of times uh, throughout the 18th century and er the early modern time period, you may see a lot of bayonet charges, you may see a lot of like melee pushes, but the actual amount of melee combat isn't going to be anywhere near that extent, so to say. Um, a lot of times, if you're pushing with bayonets, you're, uh, both sides are kind of hoping that the other side is going to break before it actually comes to a melee fight. Um, you lose a lot of guys in melee, it tires them out, and it's terrifying. You know, it's, it's a bit of a difficult thing to do. Um, and in a lot of these early modern armies, you're not seeing anywhere near the same extent of bayonet drilling, bayonet like formalization that you would in more of a Victorian time period. You know, like in Victorian, you have all these like, you know, high port, low port, and you know, ha ha, all the drilling videos you see of like men practicing with their bayonets. It's not as common in the 18th century. It's not as much of a thing. The first like treatises on how to fight with a bayonet they're really coming out after the Napoleonic Wars. And it's possible that some of them are talking about what they did in the Napoleonic Wars, but there's no like official manuals or anything. So like if a single regiment decides to train up the men, it's not gonna be an army-wide thing. Anyway, that could be a whole separate video. But the point is, um, it's possible, yes, that a pawn could be of greater use in a melee fight, but the question is, how often is it actually going to enter into that melee fight to justify their presence as opposed to, say, another firearm? Although it's also worthy of note that a lot of times the role of a sergeant in particular here uh, is not going to be so much to be firing his musket, but he's actually going to be looking at the men in under his charge in that company, in that subdivision, haha, -ha, previous video if you haven't seen it, um, and he's got to be making sure that their, you know, that their muskets are going off well, and if not, he'll have something like a musket tool to give to them. That's also another topic. Moving on. Um, he's got to make sure that they're firing in good order, that they're maintaining discipline, all that kind of thing. His concern is more what's going on all around him, as opposed to just being one more musket to be firing off. M sergeants could be shooting, it's just not necessarily like required in the same way that obviously a private soldier, his main job is going to be shooting. So yeah, there are a number of potential advantages, but none of them are really all too, too great to justify its existence necessarily. Um, the biggest thing I think for a polearm is that it's distinctive. You know, you may have been thinking, and I wouldn't blame you at all, dear viewer, you know, sitting there in your chair looking at this video like, man, he looks great carrying that thing. I mean, I, I know, I agree. Contain yourselves, please. If you wish to show your support for the beauty that is Brandon F. carrying a polearm, I don't know, Patreon or something. I don't know. I'll talk about Patreon later. But anyways, um, a polearm is distinctive. It's different. It's a very clear identifying marker on a battlefield of where an individual is. You can imagine if you're in a fight and things are chaotic all around you, there's smoke and people are screaming and, and you're somehow lost. You're, you're trying to figure out where the sergeant is or where the lieutenant is or whoever happens to be carrying a polearm in that particular army. Well, if he is standing in the ranks with this great big weapon stretching way up into the sky, it's going to be a lot easier to find him in that battlefield. You locate the sergeant or whoever it is to relay the order or to request orders, whatever it is. It's an identifying mark that this person is somehow more important, that you should be treating them with more respect, so to say. He's higher up than you are. He's more important than you are. As a reenactor, that's the only thing you really have to know is if he's carrying a polearm, they're more important than you are. For the exact same reason why a sergeant's coat might be a slightly different color in most armies, why they might have more lacing on their uniforms, all these different things, it is a designation of rank. It's a distinction. And one could argue exactly how practical a purpose such as that is. Uh, you might argue that it's more useful on a parade ground than on an actual battlefield. And that's where we get into a lot of these questions as far as, well, how were the weapons used? Were they really used? How important were they? And, you know, were they actually brought into a battlefield? Or did the army just leave them behind as soon as the actual fighting began? Um, and it's expected that in North America, more often than not, the British Army was not actually carrying pole arms. But I have prattled on long enough. Who am I? I'm just some guy who stole his friend's stick with a pointy end and started prattling on about it. I think it's time that we bring on the man himself, the creme de la meme, the halberd man, Johnny Boy. He's, he's clapping. He's faking clapping. Anyways, we have to 
I would have him walk on, but we, I have to give him the microphone and everything, so we're just gonna, all right. Oh, but a quick hold there, because you know that I can't just go off promoting someone else's YouTube channel before shilling out my own first, of course. Let me just say a quick word about Patreon, and now another method to support my channel on Utreon. Did you know that for supporting me on those platforms for as little as $1 a month, you can get all sorts of great benefits like access to my live stream VODs and 25% off all the merchandise on my store? I even post videos early there for my supporters when I can. And hey, that single dollar may not sound like it would really make much of a difference, but it can actually represent the equivalent in advertising revenue of anywhere from 500 to 2,000 views depending on the video. So hey, if you want to help me make more videos like this one and like all the others, and help me worry a lot less about whether the YouTube algorithm happens to like me in any given month, well, it's a small token that means an awful lot. You can find out more by following the links in the description directly, or by visiting nativeoak.org slash join. Thanks so much. And now, over to Mr. Far Off Station. So before we get into a little bit of the deeper history of the halberd and its uses in the American War of Independence, um, why don't we quickly talk about this reproduction. So this reproduction here is one from the latter half of the 20th century, and I believe this was a Godwin reproduction. Um, now if we compare this to the extant halberds from the 18th century, this is actually a relatively faithful reproduction. While it might be great to see from long distances and looks very regional on the battlefield, it does have the downside of this. It gets caught in a tree very easily. Now, one of my guys uh, in my company actually makes videos and there's a really good clip of me getting it caught on a tree. That is probably one of my most embarrassing moments in reenacting ever, uh, just, just objectively. Now, what does the primary source documentation say about this? Well, in February of 1776 in the orderly book, it says, that sergeants are to basically dispense with their halberds and trade them in for firelocks. It isn't very specific of why. We can probably take some pretty good guesses. One of them, as I've just shown you, it gets caught in a tree. As North America is a very broken country in more ways than one. One thing in North America that we see very common is the halberd being, not the halberd, but weapons in general being carried at the trail. Now, if you look at me here and you try to carry a halberd at trail, it's, as you can see, it's not, it's not ideal remotely in the slightest. So if you're going up an incline, just like we have here, um, you try to go up a hill, and this is something I've gone through many times with the halberd, and you, you do try to trail it, it, it's very hard to get it not to bang on the ground. And then if you carry it um, up a little more, now it wants to go down. And also in personal experience, I have gone forward with the halberd and pole vaulted myself. So in instances like that, the halberd is not the most utilitarian weapon of the battlefield. So we can probably deduct that might have been one of the reasons that it was not very popular and thus dispensed with in North America. Now I will say comparatively this to a musket, this actually isn't as ungainly as one thinks. It's relatively light, but it is a little top heavy. But when you do carry it in the traditional fashion, in the traditional sense, it's, it's, it's not bad. But when you try to do anything else with a halberd, it is just, it does then start to become ungainly. Now, when you're doing a bayonet charge, again, there aren't very many with this weapon being used in the AWI that we can tell because they were dispensed with very quickly. Um, it's not very clear how they would have gone about charging bayonets. Yes, we have lots of treatises about halberd fighting from when this was a main battlefield weapon in the 14th and 15th centuries, but in the AWI, there's not a whole lot on that. Um, you know, you could potentially charge it like that. You could also charge it like a musket, um, and it works pretty well, and it does give you a nice reach on your opponent as such. So as Brandon talked about earlier, um, the use of the halberd on the battlefield, it does uh, work very well for trying to dress the men in ranks. Again, not a hell of a lot of documentation on it and if that was actually used, but it does work um, tremendously well. 
I've used it a couple times now to redress men's as we're falling back. That's one thing I try to push um, in, in our companies a little bit, is it is okay for men to break. It is natural for men to break. And this does work extraordinarily well to redress a rank of men. And it also looks really cool when you do it. Um, the one thing with a halberd in the reenacting setting though, is you need to be slightly careful with the head. Obviously you have the hatchet head here, which is what it's referred to um, in the discipline of the Norfolk militia. It is referred to as a hatchet. Uh, that you just have to be a little careful with is this is pointy, pointy, pointy. So probably not very great when it comes to um, if you're an insurance and adjuster. So how does this compare to a weapon used by an officer? This is merely just a weapon for sergeants as it is just a peasant soldier's weapon. That might be a little derogatory, uh, yes, but that is what it is. An officer's weapon is essentially just a spontoon, which is kind of just this piece here, but larger. And that is actually a really good way of differentiating ranks of an officer versus a sergeant. Um, again, though, officers very quickly in the American War of Independence dispense with their spontoons and pull out um, fire locks. And we even see Jeremy Lister on April 19th, 1775, where he's like, yes, I get to use my fire lock. And he gets shot in the shoulder anyway. So, uh, excuse me, in the elbow, so it doesn't really matter anyway. But that is another rank dis uh, distinguishing factor. So when it comes to officers and uh, sergeants, the best way to kind of look at a sergeant is to call him a discount officer because he does carry a polearm like an officer. He has a brighter coat like an officer. He has a silver laced hat like an officer. But all these different things together are things that you might see on an officer, but of slightly less quality. So that is also what the halberd kind of is. It is just a distingu distinguishing factor of rank. So essentially, if you want to know when this weapon was used during the American War of Independence, a generally good rule of thumb is 77 for the latest. For regiments in Boston, that would be February of 1776. As we know, because I've just mentioned it earlier, it is mentioned in the general orders. Um, and the last known date that I've been able to find, I'm sure there are other ones out there, but in the great world of research, you can only go to what you can find and what you can search on the internet. There's always more out there. But the latest that I can find is the 54th Regiment dispensing with them in 1777. Um, Firelocks are, for all intents and purposes, probably more practical for the terrain of North America. So I think that's all there is to say about the halberd. Thank you all so very much for watching, uh, especially, of course, to our most distinguished membership on the, at the, na at, uh, the Native Oak, Patreon, Patreon and, Ut and Utreon. Oh, Utreon that's right. exists. Um, I, I used him as free labor. His, that's right. His, his name is the Far Off Station. He's going to be linked down below. He does very good work, so check him out. And um, until the next time, I am and I shall remain your most humble, humble and, and obedient, obedient of, of servants. servants. We did it. We did it. We did it. Like three takes, but we did it. <laughs> it was a little rambly. I just don't know what the people at home want to say. <laughs> it is actually weird, though, how little there is. People of the internet, you cannot put this into a cringe compilation of Brandon F. Yeah.